وكلا نقص عليك من أنباء الرسل ما نثبت به فؤادك وجاءك في هذه الحق وموعظة وذكرى للمؤمنين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so last week we came to the no, this is the second session of Yusuf alayhi salatu salam and the last week we came to ayah number nine and at the at, at the end of ayah number nine there's this very interesting part where Yusuf alayhi salam and brothers they mention two reasons why they're going to try and kill him one is that they want their father's face to be the only one that gives them the the attention and that is really the the crux of uh, the crux of all jealousy, which is they want attention, which I've mentioned last week. And the second one was that when a criminal commits a crime, to make it easy for him to commit the crime, he has to justify his actions. And to justify the actions, what people do is, people religiously make things up. People religiously make things up. You know, so yeah, it's okay for me to do that. Yeah, because of circumstances, because of this, because of that. And they might not have a single shred of evidence from the Quran or the Sunnah to do it, but they'll make it up. <laughs> and there are people who've done that time and again. So, for example, if, uh, you know, we know the extent of, I'm just giving a random example, okay? We know that the extent of the hijab is that they should cover, you know, their, their, their hair basically, all their hair and with that the Quran has said to drop it onto their bosom so that means that has to be covered as well a part of the hijab and you find that there are different types of women who will justify what the extent of the hijab is and why it's okay for them to wear that type of hijab so there are certain women who wear the hijab and they'll have the bosom showing there are some of them that have the hijab, full hijab but their arms are showing there are certain women that have the hijab, but they have a loose one, so part of the hair will show. Some of them will have a very loose one, so it's not even covering the hair properly. It's, it, you can see many parts of it. There's some that have a see-through hijab. Some that have you on the neck. It's like, you know, that's not really, that's, that's okay. See, it's my culture, so it's okay, right? It's all, all these things. Now, you might want to expand that on many different parts of the religion. And there's people who justify, like, for, for example, a thief who wants to go to steal and he's a Muslim, he'll justify it in his head. And I'm telling you this, criminals, whether he's a murderer, whether he's a thief, he will justify. So what would a thief do? A thief will think to himself, oh, I've got to, I just have, first, you know, I just have to do this, you know, I just have to do this. You know, you know it's like, man, how can I live like this? How can I live like this? I ain't got enough. How can I live like this? No, 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 it's not right. I mean, why should he have more? I mean, it should have been distributed equally. I mean, he should have given me, you know, that what he's got. Since he hasn't given me what he's got, I'm going to go and get it. <laughs> I'm going to go and get it. That's his theft. And he's justified in his head. And I tell you one thing here, yeah, there are many thieves, when they come out <coughs> at the night, out of their door, to commit theft, they say, Bismillah. <laughs> I'm not joking. They say Bismillah. They take Allah's name. Why? Because they, they've already justified in their head. It's got to be okay. Like, I'm going to give you another example. Yeah? All these policemen that we know back, you know, most of the countries that, that we, we attributed to, um, a lot of them, not all the policemen, but a lot of them take uh, bakhshish, bribe. bakhshish, bribe, uh, you call it uh, halwa, <laughs> they give so many names. Yeah. Halwa, which is a sweet. Yeah, they call it hadiya. You know, it's, it's called a gift, right? And they've got so many different names for it. But at the end of the day, it's all bribe. Now, the majority of them in many of these countries are taking it, but they justify it. How do they justify? It? They justify it because everyone's. One of the most common thing is everyone's doing it, so it should be okay for me to do it. That's a justification of committing a crime that you're not allowed to do. Another one is that. 
um, that, that I've got to do because if I don't do it, then I'm going to look, look silly. Or if I don't do it, then I, I will be no one in this game. If I don't do it, then oh, you know, how am I going to, how am I going to survive because everyone's doing it and everyone's in it. Justification. Or the most common one which most of these criminals make is the one the Quran has said. That straight after this crime, you're going to do Tawbah. That's the most common one. Let me just do it. Let me, let me, let me just do it. Let me just do it. Drugs. Watching something with their eyes they're not supposed to watch, whatever it is. Let me, let me just get over the I say, let me just get over and done with. Once they've gone over the field, they've already said before they go into the sin, they're going to do Tawbah. I will make a proper Tawbah. I don't worry, I'll, I'll make, you know, didn't Allah say that if you make Tawbah, Allah forgives your sin? So surely if I commit the sin and then I do Tawbah, Allah's going to forgive my sin? Yeah, so they've already justified it before they commit the crime. And that's what the Quran is saying here yeah, in Surah Yusuf, ayah number nine, that وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ After that, you're going to do Tawbah and you will become, what the Quran has actually said, is you will become a group of people that are righteous. That means, you know what? We're going to do such a good Tawbah that never again in our lives will we need to commit another crime. Oh, you know, we'll become angels, basically. Yeah? We won't need to commit any more crimes after this. And the shaitan makes them justify this. Now, what prompted them to do this? It's a big question. According to some tafsirs, like I said last week, Yusuf salam was the one who told them about the dream. The dream created jealousy. And then after that, they, they, they said what they said. Another one is that Yusuf alayhi salam, this is another tafsir, genuine tafsir. Is that Yusuf salam, did not disobey his father. When his father said, don't tell them, don't tell your brothers about the dream, he didn't tell them about the dream. However, now this gets interesting. How did the brothers know? If you didn't tell the brothers, how did the brothers know? Well, you don't have to tell the brothers for the brothers to know something. You don't have to tell someone for them to know something. You don't have to tell your neighbors directly for them to know something. You just have to tell one person who loves gossiping. Or the best part is, you know when someone comes to you and says, I'm not supposed to say this to you, but, <laughs> I'm not supposed to say this to you, but, yeah, this is what happened. Don't tell anyone else. Oh my God. So the worst people I tell you. If you've got a friend like that that comes to, you, comes to you and says, I'm not supposed to have said this to you, and then he tells you something, don't you ever trust that guy. Because why? Because your secrets that you're telling him not to tell anybody else, he's going to go and say. Judge people for how they are with you. And this is a really good, um, you know, the really good measurement tool. Is that if somebody comes to you and starts gossiping bad about others, you know what? I don't like to keep them as friends. I, I'm telling you this personally. When I see people come to me and they want to straight away talk bad about somebody else and they want to join my circle of friends and they want to talk about somebody else, I will smart, you know, I'll, I'll tell them straight away, look, it's not nice for us to speak like this. That's fine. But you know what I've registered in my head? I didn't like that. And the way the person has just spoken to me in, you know, with, about others, and you know, basically we're not talking about him coming to me as an imam and saying, Imam, I'm in a bit of a pickle, you know, I want you to give me some advice. It's not like that. He's just coming to me and he's like getting chummy chummy and said, you know what, I heard this about this so and so. He's just getting chummy. It's just called, you know, sweet, you know, backbiting. And that kind of thing, you know, is not obviously halal. So what I do is I register it and I think, you know what, I don't, I don't want to have this person as part of my close friends or my friends. Because if he can do that about so-and-so, he's going to do that about me. That's the thing. If somebody comes to you and, and tells you a lie about somebody else, that they got away with a lie, then guaranteed that person can do the same thing with you. You just wait just for a few years and you'll see that. And this is a good benchmark to, to talk, you know, to rule, to, you know, to, to measure people. <laughs> so what happens here is that Yusuf salam said it to someone in the family. And that person, you know, was mashallah. And they could be a really nice person, whoever he was. And they basically said it to someone else. Well, eventually it got to the brother's ears. 
Okay, so that's a, that's another tafsir. Another tafsir is that Yaqub alayhi salatu salam, he didn't give Yusuf alayhi salam the entire interpretation of the dream. And I'm going to go into this now about a person when you go to them for interpretation of a dream, how much they should tell you, not tell you. But Yaqub alayhi salam gave Yusuf alayhi salam many good news or, you know, piece of good news that he would already know that he's a chosen one. So, in ayah number six, when he said, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ O Yusuf, Allah will choose you. Your Lord is going to choose you. What this means is that your Lord is going to make you a prophet. Now, how did he know that? Well, as I said to you earlier, that people who know the interpretation of dreams can read a lot into dreams. Okay? It's not a common thing. See, you know, normal people, they will not be able to see this, the moon bowing down to them. Mm -mm. Even if a per person sees the moon following them, even a person sees in dream the moon following them, that means this is a saint of Allah. Or well, this, this is a very, this is a person who's going to be very close to Allah. That's, that's the moon because. There, in in alam al ru'ya in the world of of the science of uh, dreams there are things there that that represent this world and one of the things that the moon represents is you know great dignity that allah azza wa jal has kept for 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 the person who has seen it but to see the actual sun or the moon bowing down to them is something totally different it goes to another level and it will actually make a person, um, it will give them the status that they will, they will be a prophet. I mean, he knew this. And he knew that, I mean, another thing is that prophets, when they have dreams, it's going to be absolutely true. And the other thing that he said is that he knew from the dream that Yusuf salam would know the interpretation of dreams. Now, what that means is, subhanAllah, it means that Ibrahim salam knew the interpretation of dreams. And this thing, Ishaq salam, and Yaqub salam, and now one of these 12 sons is going to be blessed with the legacy of Ibrahim salam, and the prophethood and the seed will carry on. Which son is it going to be? It's going to be this son. Now it's revealed through this when he said your Lord is going to choose you. It means that Allah is going to make you a prophet. And it also means that you're going to be the best out of all the children, the most prominent out of them. And you will have this science and this knowledge that will carry on. And it also means another thing, which is for those 11 stars to bow down to him for the, for the sun and moon to bow down to him. It shows that Yusuf alayhi salatu salam has to go through trials because a people don't come back to you seriously seeking your forgiveness because one of the things about the 11 stars bowing down to him is that Yusuf is, is getting you know he, he's, he's able to see his superiority over his brothers okay? in the future he's going to see a great superiority over them and one of the other things it reveals is that Yaqub when he he's the son in the in the dream as in the S-U-N, that son in the dream. So when he bows down, it shows that Yusuf salam, is going to get such a maqam and a station in front of Allah Azza wa Jal, that he will surpass his father. He will surpass his father. And you will see the qualities that Allah Azza wa Jal has given Yusuf salam, he never gave Yaqub salam, right? And just on the names now, I just want to tell you that if you know if you know the car if you know a few Yaqubs, you remember I told you about if you know a few Ismails, if you know a few Ishaqs, if you know a few Ibrahims, yeah, you'll see this this common denominator between them. Well, there's going to be through this story, you will see the character of Yaqub alayhi salam being revealed and Yusuf alayhi salam being revealed. And wherever you've got a character of Yaqub and you've got a character of Yusuf, the Yusuf is always more dominant than the Yaqub. I want you to think of a Yaqub that you know and I want you to, th you think, to think of a Yusuf that you know. Put your hands up if you know a Yaqub in your life, someone called Yaqub and someone called Yusuf. Put your hands up if you've got two individuals like that that you know. Ooh, not many people. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. 
I see six thunder something. Now tell me, all those people, if you agree that the Yusuf that you know has got a stronger character than the Yaqub that you know, put your hands up. And if you think it's the other way, Yaqub is stronger than the Yusuf, put your hands up. Okay, good. What Yaqub alayhi salam alayhi he'll have a stronger personality in some ways. But the Yusuf will, will be smarter in certain ways. Will be smarter in certain ways. And the other thing that you'll see is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying Yaqub is a, is, a, is, is a soft character, he's got no strength. He's got great strength. One of the greatest strengths of Yaqub is the inner strength. Right? But I'll tell you another thing here. Those of you who know a Yusuf, put your hands up. Go on, just put your hands up. Ah, so I love it. Yusuf is a common name, yeah? And now you lot put your hands up if you think that that Yusuf you know is a handsome individual, put your hands up. He's a beautiful, handsome individual, put your hands up. Okay, that's, that's, that's uh, quite a lot of you out of the ones that you put your hands up. I wouldn't say it's all of you, but it's almost all of you put your hands up. And that's one of the characteristics that Allah Azza wa gives these people is that you will have certain trends and traits of those people that carry that name. So what happens here is, and we'll see their characters develop, and I'll make comments about their, their characters and whoever's name is Yaqub and whoever's name is Yusuf. But one of the things, things here is that the son surpasses the father and the father is very happy about this, that this is going to happen. Because he wants this, this whole thing of Ibrahim alayhi salam seed to go forward and to become better in each of the sons that come out of their progeny. So all these reasons or one of these ways that the brothers found out about Yusuf alayhi salam being better than them causes them to have the jealousy. And there's one final one, which is... There's some tafsir that say that it was nothing to do with the dream. It was nothing to do with them knowing the dream. It was simply to do with the, the, the love they saw of their father um, to those two children over them. And that's what caused the jealousy. And from there it all started. Now, there's another one thing, which is at the end of ayah number 8, they say, Inna abana lafi mubin. Our father, you know, he's in a clear era, or our father is, is emotionally, is emotionally, you know, gone astray. Now, why did they say this? This shows that when people, see, when people cannot make, you know, they can't get their way, they'll make something up. Don't make an excuse. You know, when they want their way, they're going to make an excuse. Doesn't matter which way they want. It's, it's going to happen, all right? Or it's already happened. And basically, they want to justify what happened and they will make an excuse. So basically, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a story. Yeah, it's one of the. This is just a, one of those fairy tale stories. But you know, just just for us to think about this. There was a wolf. They say, on on a hilltop, and there's a lamb right at the bottom of the hilltop of, of the hill. And from the top, the wolf sees this lamb, and it says, "That's it. That's my lunch. That's my lunch." So he's already made his mind up that this is going to be his lunch. There's a stream that's flowing all the way down. And the lamb is drinking some water, so the wolf comes all the way down and he sees the lamb. He says, Hey, you! The lamb looks up, eh. says, Hey, you! You're the one that called me so many names. He says, eh, I don't call anyone any names. Yeah. He said, Well, if you didn't call me any names, yeah. You're the one last year, last year, you was the one that caused me some harm. He said, I was only born six months ago. I wasn't even, I wasn't even around last year. He said, doesn't matter, I mean, you must be the one that is creating some hurt to me in some way, some insult to me in some way, and therefore you're going to be finished right now. And the, 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 the lamb, before he gets eaten, says, well, you know, one who's an oppressor and is going to do his crime, he's going to find any excuse to justify his crime, right? So these sons, they, they, they've got this jealousy. Instead of seeing their own jealousy, they blame their father for showing his extreme love towards the children. And that's what people do. Instead of focusing on oneself, see, one of the most difficult things to focus on is your own problems. And this surah reveals so much about the human psyche. See, what the brothers are not doing here is they're not addressing their own problem. They're, they're turning it around to others. And this is a serious human problem. 
Most human beings can't see their own problem. Today, you know, we've got a real situation in the world where, for example, there might be certain governments are saying, hey, we're going to smoke you out your holes, yeah? And those same governments can't see their own problems. And the ones who are, you know, on the other side, they can't see their problems. So on the Muslims out there, some of the others out there, they can't see their own problems. And what happens in the end is that people justify their act because of the other. One of the, one of the biggest losers game, I tell you right now, is, you know, if something goes wrong, you carry on blaming an enemy out there. That's a loser's game. And second is you blame it on someone that either is close to you and loves you dearly or you blame it on someone who you don't even know whether they are around or they exist but it's someone out there that's doing it right so for example when you blame it when you blame it on someone uh, someone else what you're doing ultimately is that you're just taking it away from yourself it's, it's never your fault it can't be your fault you justify it and this is what the what the children are doing here they're saying no no it's dad's fault dad's fault he's the one that he's got his love so much for the for the son he's making us do this almost i mean it's not it's not us it's him his love is getting in the way the second thing is who they're blaming they're blaming the father the father is so close to them. The father loves them. The father feeds them. The father gives them so much. And they're taking this all out on their father. Like he's the problem. He's the cause. When it's not even the father. And I want to say this to you guys. That you know, many a fathers, many a fathers come to, come to an age where their kids are teenagers. And they have to go through this. Many a mothers have to go through this. Where the mother and the father have got the ultimate love for the child. But the child is rebelling. And the child is trying to blame their parents for something that wasn't even their fault. But they just switch it onto them and say, well it, well, it must have been their fault. It was their fault. It is their fault. It could be nothing but their fault. And how do they justify it? Well, the Quran tells us it's, the, it's getting together as a group. And one, one says one, another says, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, peer pressure. This is what happened between the brothers of Yusuf. And when they said, Uqtulu Yusuf, kill him. Because it was pre pressure. Why did Allah say Uqtulu Yusuf first in ayah number nine? And later on he says, the one who says, there's one of the brothers who says, Don't kill him. Allah says, Qala qailu minhum. One of them who spoke said, La taqtulu Yusuf. Don't kill Yusuf. But when he this is in ayah number ten. But in ayah number nine, Allah says, Uqtulu Yusuf. He didn't even say they, did, they said Yusuf because what happened is it was quite a few of them saying that. Quite a few of them saying that. And it's not because they all said it once. Ah, this is the thing. One of them would say something, another one would say something, the other one would say something, and one of them somewhere would say, kill him. Another one agrees, yes, kill him. I would say, yeah, 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 let's kill him. Kill him. You know, this is how a conversation starts. This is how it gets to the murder, you know, the, the, the conspiracy for murder. Because they are in a group and one's affecting the other and the moods are boiling. And when moods boil, then it moves from one to another to another and the anger gets, gets more heat and then more heated and then they think, okay, that's it. We, we're going to justify to kill him, right? And I said to you just a little earlier ago, sometimes, someone, sometimes you blame someone who you don't even know for your problems. Like, you know, some people in this day and age, I'm just going to say this, some people in this day and age, all the Muslims' problem, everything, whatever is happening to Muslims all across the world, everything is happening because of the Illuminati. Oh my God. So where are they? <laughs> like, come on, man. All your problems are bla blamed on them. So you did nothing wrong here. It was just them that came on you and just caused it. Anyway, let's move on. So what happens is that there's a group of them and there's prayer pressure that starts and then Allah says, Qala qailu minhum. Now this, this is interesting. Why did Allah say one of them said, don't kill him? Because Allah wants to reveal to us that, you know, when there's a bunch of criminals and they make a crime, they're not all equal. Just because nine people or ten people got together and they all consulted and the thing, the opinion was given to murder someone, it doesn't mean that they're all equal. Some of them would not have definitely gone by that. So what I want to say by this is, you know these governments and other you know, organizations that make 
judgments and they make decisions, not all of them are equal. Please remember that. There are good people amongst them. And they say that this brother thought that, you know what, this, this has gone too far. And he showed justification of why they should not kill him. He said, La taqtulu Yusuf. Don't kill him. Why not? You're going to kill, murder a person because you lot are feeling or we're feeling that our father, his, his love is more for him than us. Are we just going to kill him? He said, now you can't just stop there and say, just don't kill him. See, this is the other beautiful thing about the Quran. Whenever you want to stop someone from doing something, there, there's sometimes you can go for the lesser of the two evils. They're going to come and they're going to do some harm anyway. Now, all you're doing is you're diverting them to a lesser harm. All right? So this is exactly what happened when Umar ibn Khattab عنه, was coming to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Is that when he was coming to kill him, there's a, there's a Muslim on the way, he saw Umar and Umar his eyes were red and he's, he's, he had his, you know, his sword in his hand and he was pouncing ahead and he was on a mission. You know, he's going to do a job. And he said, oh, you know, he looked at me and thought, yeah, this guy, this guy is going to do some chop, chop, chewy today, you know. Chop, chop, chewy. He's going to kill someone. So he stopped him. He said, Umar, 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 where are you going? Now, Umar didn't know he was a Muslim. He said, Umar, where are you going? He said, me? Straight. You know that man who said that all these gods are false? And he says, only Allah is this. I'm going to go and kill him. So now, this Muslim thought, Ya Allah, I need to buy time to go and warn the Prophet So to buy the time, what did he say? Omar, really? <laughs> you gonna go and kill, kill this man Muhammad? When your own sister has embraced Islam and you don't do anything about it? He goes, huh? You know, like, my God. He's like, huh? Well, I'm gonna kill the man and then people are gonna say my sister was the one who you know, embrace Islam, why didn't I sort my family members out first? Said, yeah, your family member, your sister, she embraced Islam. And you don't know about it. Now, this was a secret. Why did this Muslim open that secret? Because he needed to buy time. If he, if he didn't do this right now, Umar could go straight ahead and kill the Prophet He needed to warn the Prophet So Umar thought, huh? Really? Okay, I'm going to my sister's house first. I'll deal with her first. And then I'll deal with this guy called Muhammad. He thought, job done. So when he went to his sister, now look, what, when he goes to his sister, of course, he's going to go to his sister's husband, who's also converted and he's told him about it. He's going to beat the daylight out of him. And he knows that. But he'd rather go over there, cause some damage, than to come and cause damage to Rasulullah So he quickly went and warned the Prophet oh, oh, Prophet I saw Umar on the way to kill you and I diverted him down there. He's coming, Ya Rasulullah. He's coming to kill you. Right? Now, what I want to say about this is that this is in some ways showing us that, that when there's a group of people, sometimes one of them could divert their whole attention towards something smaller. So what he said is that, look, guys, you don't need to kill him. Why are you trying to kill him? The reason why you guys are trying to kill him is because you're trying to move him, they're trying to remove him from dad's life. There are other ways of removing him from dad's life. You don't have to kill him. You can throw him away. What we'll do is, you know, Yusuf's a little kid. He'll fit into one of those buckets that, you know, you, you draw water from the well. We'll stick him inside the bucket. You know, let, the, let the whole thing drop. The rope will go all the way down to the bottom. And guys, it's not like we want to kill him because that's, that's another way of killing the, killing the poor boy. He could die in that well. No, no, no. We know there's water down the well. So when we drop him down, <laughs> we'll come back. And of course, as always, this is a main road. So caravans are going by and one of the caravans are going to come by. One caravan of people who are going across will definitely stop there for some water. And when they lift it up, they're going to see Yusuf. And they're going to take that kid away from this town. And they're going to take him away. And we never see him again. In Kuntu Fadi, if you want to do something, you better just do this. Now, why did he add these words, in Kuntu Fadi? In Kuntu Fadi. 
One reason is, in Kuntum Fa'il Azim, if you're going to do anything, you better just do this, otherwise I'm not with you. Now they say that this was the, old, the eldest out of all the brothers. Now if the eldest out of the brothers is not with them, the rest of them are probably not going to do it. Because, oh my God, we haven't got the backing of our older brother. If our older brother doesn't back us up, then maybe you know, he might grasp us up to our father and the father is going to find out what we did. So we need all ten brothers to be on this whole thing. All right. So in Kuntu Fadin, if you're going to do what you're going to do is, it means that if you're going to do what you're going to do, like as in get rid of Yusuf, you better go with this plan, otherwise I'm not going with any other plan. And in Kuntum Fail, another, another way of looking at it is that if you guys are really serious of doing something, you better just do this because I know you're not going to kill him. You know, sometimes people get really mad and say, that's it, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to bust his nose and I'm going to break his back. And, I'm gonna... and, the, and the truth of it is, he's not going to do that. Truth of it is, he'll probably beat him up, but he's not going to break his back and bust his nose or whatever. So in Kuntum Fail, means that you can't be serious, guys. Not all of you are going to do this, all right? Maybe some of you will go so mad to do this, but what are you guys saying? Do you realize what you're saying? If you're really going to do something, as in if you're really able to practically carry something out, then perhaps this is the best you guys can do. All right? So what they did is they said, okay, how do we get our father? They said, okay, we'll say that, you know, Yusuf, poor Yusuf, he's at home. He needs to be out and about. Okay? And we know father doesn't trust us with Yusuf. They knew this clearly. That Yusuf is like one of those guarded angels around Yaqub And the other thing that Yaqub knew is that these boys would want to harm him because of the fact that they found out that he's going to become a prophet. That he is the chosen one amongst them. So he didn't want to let Yusuf Alayhi go out. So what I told you last week, every day what happens is that Yusuf Alayhi stays home and the boys go out to look after the sheep. And they're the ones who have to toll really hard. So they came, this is ayah number 11 now. They said, Ya Adana, Oh our father, Malak, Dad, what's, what's with you? La <laughs> tamanna ala Yusuf. You don't, you don't even think that we could be safe with Yusuf? You don't even think that we could be in a way with Yusuf where Yusuf could be safe with us? We're just, we just, we just always with Yusuf. You know, Yusuf, we're so open with Yusuf. And, you know, we're so honest with Yusuf. And already they're lying out there, you know, their mouth. They're lying. And Yaqub knows this. He knows that there's severe jealousy of his other sons with Yusuf And whatever they're saying is not the most honest thing. And when they say we're being so honest, now this Quran reveals when somebody wants to do, you know, when somebody comes up to you and they fill it up with loads of, you know, extra, extra, extra kind of... Um, you know, um, when, when somebody's trying to show that, you know, you've really got to believe them and they're putting extra words in to get your trust. When they load it with so much extra, which is out of the norm all of a sudden, you think, man, there's something going up. There's something going wrong, right? So normally what would happen is that these boys would come, say, Dad, okay, yeah. Oh, they're not bothered about you, so. They don't care about Yusuf. Normally this has been their trait every day. They don't talk good about Yusuf. They've never asked to take Yusuf out. They've never even come to dad and said, Dad, you know what, what you know, send us out. They just left it. They know that their dad loves him so much, he's not going to let him out. Now all of a sudden, one day when his sons come up and say, Dad, why don't you let us go? Hey, what's wrong with these lot, man? What's wrong with them? All of a sudden, they've changed. In one day, they've said, they're using, look, how many words? They're saying, Malaka, what's wrong with you? Why don't you trust us with Yusuf? And we've been so honest with him. And arsilhu ma'ana. This is now ayah number 12. Send him with us tomorrow. They've never asked this before. Send him with us tomorrow. Yarta, well, he'll enjoy the day. He will play. And while he plays, we are definitely absolutely going to look after him and secure him and put him in safety now how much secure how much secure they're talking about first they said 
Do you not think we're safe with him? Look, safe. Then they said, we are honest. We're being very open and honest. Then they said, We are definitely and most certainly going to secure him. And when all of a sudden these people talk about safety and security, what goes in your mind? They want to do something, right? You don't get people all of a sudden saying all of this, right? What does the Quran teach us? The Quran teaches us that human behavior should be judged on induction. Right? So what I mean by this is that there are going to be very few occasions where you will see human beings um, going out of their norm for a good reason. Most of the times when human behavior becomes erratic, it changes. All of a sudden there's something going on. It's fishy. Especially when humans are going to justify and justify and over justify things and they're going to make you feel bad of not going along with what they're saying when all along they've never been like this then you know certainly that there's something wrong man let me give you an example prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in medina munawwara and the sahaba used to come and they used to say ya rasulullah um, can i ask you a question and they would sometimes come ya rasulullah you know i just love you that's it I just love you. I said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, could you please come to my house? I'd like to, you know, feed you something or give you something. Ya Rasulullah, can you accept this hadiyah from me, this, this gift from me? Right? This is the normal Muslim that might come. Or even if he's got nothing to give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I just, I just like being next to you. That's it. Now, that's what a normal, ordinary, ordinary person would say, okay? Or a sahabi. What did the hypocrites come and say? And Allah recorded this. And this is human psychology. This is human. There's, there's no other reason why Allah revealed this except He wants us to think about human beings when they come to you and they speak to you. Can you judge them on the merits of their previous days and judge them according to all other people that come to you? Because some of the people who come to you and they're the sweetest you can get. They're sweet for a reason, brother. They are sweet for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes in the sweetness, there is some deep poison. And if you don't know about that, then it's going to hit you one day. So this is Surah Munafiqun, Surah number 63, ayah number 1. Allah says, <laughs> Now, the others came, Ya Rasulullah, are you okay? Ya Rasulullah, you know, I'd like to sit with you. Right, Ya Rasulullah, I love you. Munafiq comes, hypocrite comes, and he says, Nashhadu, we bear witness that you are most certainly La Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah, no doubt. No, these are Muslims. They're, they're dressed as Muslims. There's no sign to say they're Munafiq here. They're as Muslim as any other Muslim. But these Muslims come and give these words. We witness bear witness that you are most certainly the messenger of Allah oh there's no doubt why they put in so much emphasis because they know deep down that he doesn't believe them so to cover that up you need to put extra amount of you know certainty and that's what Yusuf alayhi salam sons are, uh, Yaqub alayhi salam sons are doing right now is that they're putting extra extra certainty in their father and they if you read the signs you will know that they are lying so what does Allah say in Surah Munafim? Allah says Wallahu ya'lamu inna kala rasulu. And Allah knows that you are most certainly the messenger of Allah Wallahu yashhadu inna al-munafiqina lakadhibuna and Allah bears witness that these hypocrites are definitely liars he knows you're the messenger but I know also, and I'm witnessing that they're lying about this statement they made about you, they made about you, meaning that they don't believe it. And one of the things that the Quran has done is Allah said, you know, you know, some people they just listen to you more careful than others. It's like Allah showed all this signs. He said, you know, they, they, they would want Allah said, they want to show you that you can rely on them. They want to show you that. But hang on a minute. 
if they're going to show you the messenger of Allah that you can rely on them and every time they speak they want you to listen to what they're saying and they want to show you their support for your mission Allah said yahsabuna kulla sayhatin alayhim things don't add up what doesn't add up what doesn't add up is these munafiqs, the same ones that are trying to make it to you that there is support for you, they're the same people whenever something goes wrong, they're like, oh, what just happened there? Huh? Huh? Are you, are you sure? They think everything, every problem is their problem. Every time something goes wrong, huh? Huh? every problem is their problem, you know, they're, they're shifting the movie. How can there be a support for you when all these days they are acting as if they cannot even go through any simple problem of life. So what, what do I mean by all of this is that when you look at their, their life of all the days they've spent with you and then you suddenly look at how sweet and chummy they're being with you and how they're showing you, yeah, we're with you. Mention Allah, don't worry, we're giving you support. You should know that's a lie based on what? Based on induction, based on all the other days they've spent with you, based on the days when they're really themselves, based on that. So Yaqub based on everything they've been, the way they've been with Yusuf, السلام, the way they've been with him, the way they made comments about him the way they've never asked about any protection about him the way he's always feared they might harm him and all of a sudden they come up to him and become sweet he knew that they're lying Allah in me that this is next ayah ayah number 13 and what I'm said to all of us is that we learn from this that please judge people for what they really are if you see a person who's horrible to him horrible to her good to him good to you your question should be hang on a minute he's good to me but it's horrible to him horrible to her why why can that really be a good person can a person be good when they're horrible to certain individuals if you're really good you won't be horrible to anybody true or not tell me true so when you're hor when he's horrible to some people and he's not horrible to other people you should know your turn is coming tomorrow brother your turn is coming one day. When he falls out with you, then he's going to be hard with you. If, you. if he carries on getting things off you, he's going to be nice to you. So now, next verse. Yaqub alayhi salam says, Inni la an bi. He says, it really, really will hurt me if you take him away. It's going to hurt me. It's going to cause me grief. Now, the ulama of tafsir say, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that Yaqub has never had Yusuf leave his side. This is going to be the first time Yusuf is going to spend a day without the father. Okay, a day without the father. And the second tafsir is that Yaqub knew that because of the lie, they're going to do something to him, and that's why he was grieving Nisa. That's the grief that he had. Now, according to the first tafsir, when he's got grief because he's never let Yusuf let him go and now first time he's going to have to let him go. This teaches us, brothers, that don't make anything too dear to yourself in this dunya. Not even your wife or your children or your wealth. Because whatever you make very dear to yourself, as close, the closer you make it, the more your heart loves it. And the more your heart loves it, the more it's going to hurt you when you lose it. Okay? Let's be honest about it. The things that you love most, like for example, let, let, let me give an example here. If you lost, let's say, if you lost, let's say, uh, you know, you, you lost a... a 50 pounds or something, or you lost 100 pounds. You're not bothered about it because you weren't so attached to it anyway. Right? Oh, I lost it, I lost it, halas, finished. But if you're one of those that money, 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 and when you ever want to do dhikr, it's like, you know, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, 70 pounds, 80 pounds, yeah? And you, you just can't, you can't, can't stop counting how much you've got. And it's always going through your mind, how much in my bank, how much in this, how much in my pocket, of, you know when you got that in your mind and then you lose 50 quid, man, it's going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to hurt. 
right? It could be something simple, it could be something big. Some people, they're not bothered about the car they have, you know. Some people, don't, don't attach yourself too much. And some people, they've got a car, yeah? They cannot stand a scratch on the car. Yalla. Well, don't buy an expensive car, brother. <laughs> Seriously, you don't want a scratch on your car, don't buy an expensive car. And if you're going to buy an expensive car and you don't want to get it scratched, yeah, then don't drive it on this earth. Don't drive it on this earth. Because anywhere on this earth, even if a human doesn't scratch it, a tree branch might scratch it. Yes or no? Yes. A tree branch might scratch it. It wasn't even your fault. Let's say, for example, you stay away from all the, all the tree branches. You stay all the way from all the people. And then you're driving. And then this truck right in front of you suddenly goes over the stone. And the stone flicks. And it flicks right by the side of your car. And man, you got a dent. <laughs> oh, it hurts, brother. You know when it hurts? It hurts because you have too much love for it. Buy a car, standard car, and say to yourself, you know what, it's going to die one day, yes or no? Yes. And before it dies, it's going to get scratched, yes or no? Just like you get wrinkles on your forehead, brother, the car has to get wrinkles, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah? So it has to be scratched up somehow, right? Okay, so don't treat it like some kind of, you know, uh, baby that's cocoon that ever can, no, no one's going to touch, like some hooter in of Jannah or something, okay? It's going to happen. So what I'm trying to say is that don't keep it dear. Don't keep it dear. And don't keep expensive items. If you keep a pen, a pen is worth like, even a, a good pen, 10 pound pen, it's fine. You buy a pen for 100 pounds, it's going to hurt you to lose that pen, brother. It's going to really hurt you to lose that pen. Ya Allah, there's people who buy certain things. I've heard there's women that buy handbags. Somebody told me the other day, honestly, I'm not joking yet. I know normal handbags are going to cost you 10, 20, 30 pounds, yeah? Well, if that, right? There's women that buy handbags that are costing 900 pounds, 700 pounds, 500 pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds. Yeah. And thousands are going there. But I'm just saying, when I heard 900 pounds, I thought, yalla, on a handbag? I thought, man, if the thief sees that handbag, he's going to say, I don't care what's inside. I just want to steal the handbag. Like, you know, normally you get stolen, they, 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 they open it up and they look inside. If they don't find something, they throw the handbag. This guy's going to say, forget that, this handbag. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this, man. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell it off. All right. So the point is, Yusuf, Yaqub, his extreme love for Yusuf, is going to now, in some way, cost him. He's a prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. But, and he's had dear love for this son. Yes, he's got nothing wrong with having that. Allah naturally gave him that love. But Allah's teaching is a big lesson here, which is even your son or your daughter don't have that much love for them. That you just cannot bear seeing them even have a little thing pricked in their, you know, in their fingers somewhere. You can't have that. Oh, it's going to hurt you so much. Don't get to that stage. This is life. Just accept it. If, they, if something happens to their finger, it's life. Just say it's life. It's like when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his house, Anas radiallahu anhu was, was in his house, and Anas radiallahu used to say that I used to bring the plates, right? And you know, he's a young kid, eight years old, he's bringing the plates, and suddenly a plate, oh, he fell and it broke. Oh, broken another plate again, and their wives would say, Anas, be careful, be careful, Anas, Anas, there's another time you're doing that. And Prophet would say, leave him alone. When the time for something has come to go, it's going to go. If your car crashes, brother, you should just look back and say, when the time comes for something to happen, it's going to happen. Right, stop crying over it, okay? <coughs> stop crying over it. When the time comes for something to go, it's going to go. Qaddar Allah. Allah has willed it. Whatever He willed has happened. That's it. Leave it. Get on with it. So that's the thing of not attaching yourself to these things. And those people who attach, they will have that grief. So that's one thing. Second thing He said, on top of that, he said, Ahafu. Now, this is very, very interesting. And Allah said, this is the most beautiful story you'll ever get. Yaqub tells them, tells them the excuse they're going to bring back to him after they've finished with Yusuf. Now, he knows there's something they're going to do. He said, Ahafu an ya'kulahu dhib wa antum anhu ghafilun. He said, I fear that a wolf is going to devour him, consume him outright. And while you guys, you ten sons of mine, are going to be somewhere else. And you're going to be completely 
you know, absent-minded of what is going on. Now, how did Yusuf alayhi salam say this? How did he know that part of their plan was that they're going to come back with something to do with the wealth? He didn't have the full thing. Now, we don't know how he knew this exactly, but we know because he, he was a prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah reveals certain things. And even Salihin, even those of us who are pious, like I said, we could get true dreams. So it could be through a dream he's seen something, like when Rasulullah he came on the day of Uhud. The day of Uhud, he said, in the mo this morning I've seen a dream. And the dream, I saw my sword, I took it out and I shook it. And when I shook it, it cracked in the middle. So they said, Messenger of Allah, what does that mean? He said, I have interpreted this dream to mean someone who is close to my, in my family members is going to pass away today. And that was Hamza radiallahu anhu. But he didn't know it was Hamza. He didn't know it was Hamza. He just knew someone in the family is going to pass away. Now this dream shows us clearly Allah revealed to him something that's going to happen that day. So there's a possibility that Yaqub has had a dream that something is, you know, they're going to come back and say something to him about the wealth and Yusuf alayhi salam. But obviously, he did not know that they're going to come back with an excuse that he's dead. That's most certain. Because if you know that your kids are going to take this Yusuf of yours today and not come back with him ever, la ilaha illallah, do you think you as a father you're going to let him go? No way. So he wasn't sure about what exactly would happen but he said you know maybe you got something maybe you might say that a wolf ate, ate him and something like that because he 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 probably saw it in the vision now some other ulama in tafsir they say that it was a vision of yusuf because prophets prophets have got a huge amount of firasa firasa where allah reveals things to them about the future but he might not have revealed everything he might not reveal everything. And he never, he never reveals everything and every time. Whenever he wants, he might reveal something to them. And even common, good, salihin and pious people can have this. That they might suddenly have an opening of something might happen. And they've got this feeling and that feeling is a true feeling. And Allah Azza wa Jal can, can do that even to common people. Like the mother of um, Musa alayhi salam, she thought, you know what, if I just throw my baby into the, uh, in the basket, throw the whole basket into the river, Allah's going to save him, Allah's going to re return him back to me. She just had this feeling and she just did it. And Allah says, I was the one who inspired to her to do it. But she wasn't a prophetess. There's no prophetess and she wasn't, she wasn't a prophet. But Allah can do this to salihin, to those who are pious. So whichever way he knew, he knew that something was fishy and that they're going to come back with some kind of excuse. Right? Now, there's persuasion going on. They said, Dad, Dad, la in akalahu dhib. What a wolf is going to devour Yusuf? Wow, we muscles, <laughs> one wolf. Ten brothers, strong brothers. Inna la khasirun. We're absolute failures if this happens. We're going to be finished. How can you say that? That what? Ten of your sons? You're not going to trust ten of your strong sons to try and get one wolf of Yusuf? If it comes to bite him now. The dad never said that. The dad said, when he devours him, you probably might say that you were not there. Antum anhu ghafilun, you were absent-minded. They switched it. They didn't go with the dad's version. They went with their own version. They said, look, we're strong. And if he's there, you're saying we're strong. You're saying we can't save him from one wolf. <laughs> what are you saying? Now, the per persuasion was such that the father thought that, you know what, let me just let him. You know, let me just take the risk. Let me just let him go. And even if they do something to him, how bad could it be? He never dreamt of the fact that they would not come back with Yusuf that day. He did not have that in his mind. He thought, okay, they're going to come back and they're going to make something about something happened. But he wasn't absolutely clear on what was going to be some kind of plan. But he knew that they, were, they had lies that they were trying to make up. Now, this persuasion thing we'll learn from this it happens again and again is that you know at the spur of the moment 
sometimes some people come to you and they try to persuade you in a certain way and you try to give one argument they give you another argument they want to persuade you persuade you persuade you until you feel bad in not you know you feel bad and you think okay let me go with them it's happened it even happened to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the day of uhud when in the morning he was he after fajr he called the sahaba there was senior sahaba there were minor sahaba and he said, what should we do? Should we defend the city of Medina from within? Or should we go outside and defend that city from there? And the senior Sahaba said, let's defend it from within. Because whenever we've done that message of Allah, we've never lost this city. This city has been always protected by defending it within. And the, the uh, uh, youngsters said, message of Allah, Badr. Last year we couldn't make it. This was their mentality. Last year we could make it, and angels came down, and we weren't part of that. And this year we want to go out, you know. MashaAllah, let's go out, let's go out. Because Badr happened outside of the city. Badr happened outside of the city, and 5,000 angels came down last year. So they persuaded, and they persuaded. MashaAllah, look, we are strong. MashaAllah, we can go outside, we can do this. MashaAllah, we can go out there, and we can, you know, we'll. And then Rasulullah made his decision based upon the youngsters. And then the youngsters felt they, they regretted. They came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, MashaAllah, we. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't have persuaded you like that. Prophet said, look, I put my helmet on now. Prophet has done that. He has to go out now. So he went out. But Allah still gave them victory, which turned sour because of something else, else later on. But what I want to say to you is that sometimes pers persuasion is not the way to go forward. And if someone comes to you with great persuasion, sometimes it's best to stop, to think, to give it a bit of time before you make it. And sometimes you can't do it like in the case of Yaqub alayhi So what happened here is, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ When they took Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, this is now ayah number 15, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ When they went with him, وَأَجْمَعُوا أَنْ يَجْعَلُوهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبْ What happened is that they gathered together. What did they do? Well, they took Yusuf alayhi salam as he was going and their father was letting them go. The father came out of the house and he watched them taking Yusuf alayhi salam in the distance. And as they were taking Yusuf alayhi salam in the distance, oh, hip, hip, hooray. They were swinging him, they were throwing and catching him, and they were, you know, with your arms around him and holding his hand, and, you know, they're smiling, and Yusuf is enjoying this. This is my first day out, my brothers are going to look after me, my father let me go out for the first time, it can't get any better. And, they, and the father is watching all of this, and sweet, how sweet they are with Yusuf, until they couldn't see their father again in the distance. So they thought, that's it. That's when they started to slap him and hit him. And they pushed him and said, you, you, you. <laughs> Suddenly, Yusuf <laughs> says, what is going on? What in, what in the world is going on? So they took him and they, you know, they hit him, they beat him. And then after that, they said, okay, fine, right? Where, where's that well? So they took him to that well, right? And they rolled up the bucket. They put him in there, right? And they made sure that this is happening by the evening. They didn't happen, they didn't make sure that it happened early in the daytime. Because they thought that in the daytime, if they do it, uh, like let's say midday, whatever it is, they do it, then they've got so many hours to wait till many caravans are gonna pass by, they're going to draw the water, and Yusuf's gonna come out. And if Yusuf comes out, then Oh my God, he could make a case and he could run away, come back home, whatever. They wanted it to be at a time when Yusuf doesn't have anything to do with brothers being around. So they waited till possibly the near the evening time. They put him into the bucket and they load it down. And they thought, that's it. He's not going to be found again. That's it. Now, poor Yusuf, alayhi salatu wa sallam. Now, this is, a, this is a beautiful thing Allah says. Is that, if you think about Yusuf, alayhi salam, he's going to spend now the whole night in in this well and how lonely how cold all that might have been during the night he's going to be all alone and he's thinking what is he thinking he's thinking what has happened my lovely father my house my security and all of that has just changed to what changed to my brother my brother's been so sweet and they've deserted me and they've, they they want to leave me here dead or they want to meet, leave me here near dead, or I'm, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Now Allah says, 
I put into his heart. One day, O Yusuf, you will be able to retell this story to them. Allah revealed to him. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And they won't even realize that it's you. They won't even realize it's you that's speaking. So Yusuf had that contentment. Allah gave that content. What do we learn from this? Now this is the last um, thing that we'll learn from and then we'll move on inshallah. What we learn from this is sometimes you're in a real bad position. Either Allah shows you a dream about a good future or sometimes Allah makes you feel just inside there's a feeling inside that things are going to go well. You know when you get that feeling in your heart and you're in a serious problem? Just say Alhamdulillah. The fact that Allah is giving you that strength to feel that you're going to go through this and you're going to be able to manage this, that is tawfiq from Allah. That is big tawfiq and ability from Allah that He is with you in some way. Because without that in your heart, you'd give up life. Without that, you just say, forget it. I might as well just die. I might as just give up life. And there are people who get ill and they want to give up life. Yes or no? Yes. And there are others who get ill and they fight it. One of the things you fight it is with your mind. Now I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to see through this. Right? That thing inside you, how do you know that Allah hasn't put that inside you? This is exactly what's happened to Yusuf alayhi salam. That he's feeling that one day I am going to be able to live and tell my brothers what happened and they won't even know. And this just thought just occurred, obviously it was from Allah azza wa jal. But this, the lesson that we learn from this is that in those moments when you're in a problem or your crisis and you feel that, you know what, it's all going to be over soon. It's, I'm going to get through this. That is from Allah azza wa jal. And just, just say alhamdulillah and have your iman that Allah will make things better. And then you will see, you know, you'll see the other side to it. Otherwise, you will, you will, you know, face a lot of uh, other trials like stress and depression and so on. So anyway, we've come up to this. Are there any questions on today's one? Just on today's one? Any questions? Yes. Okay, was the mother alive at the time of the uh, father? Now, tafsir say that his mother had passed away. Some tafsir. But some tafsir allude to the fact that his mother was alive. Okay, his mother was alive. Now, one of the tafsir says that because his mother is not alive, that's why Yaqub had so much love for his son, because he's not got a mother. And they say, according to the Israeli narrations, that Yaqub married four times. And one of the things I said to you last week was 10 brothers were from one mother and two from one. Well, according to some of the Israeli narrations, uh, they were split between the different mothers. Okay, they were split different between mothers. But definitely Yusuf and Binyamin are from one mother. And they say her name was Rahil. And some tafsir say that she was, um, she, she had gone by, she passed away. And some tafsir said that she lived on. And if you look at the uh, the dream, the dream says that his mother is also going to come along. So according to that, it would be his real mother. But some say that it wasn't his real mother. It was the, the, the stepmother that was alive at that time. So we don't really know, okay, for, for certain. But, you know, you could go either way, you know, with this. Okay. Jazakumullah khair. As-salamu wa akhir da'wan. Alhamdulillah alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بكر علم ونور الحاملات سنة ونور والرسمات هنا سرور يا حلوات الكاسنين